encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. Welcome to the podcast where we believe every day is a great day with Jesus. This is Today with Jesus, and I'm Robert Hadfield. And I'm Dan Winkler, and thank you for being part of our podcast. Hey, Robert, I'd like to start by making an apology. Can I do that? Oh, okay. We're going to launch so, right into this, huh? We, we yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's been a week or two since we've been able to broadcast our podcast, and I'm going to take responsibility for that. Uh, I got down in my back and I could hardly even get out of a chair. Mm. But after quite a while here, two or three weeks, we've been able to get back on the mend and are almost back to normal. And I, I, I told Diane, I said, you just can't work me as hard as you've been working me. <laughs> can't believe you're I'm saying this young. on the air. You're saying I this know. on the air right now. Wow. That's right. I want, I listen, okay. I want the world to know. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. we've gotten some, some very nice uh, messages, and I did not pass these along to you, but uh, from people just saying, hey, y'all okay? We're missing you. Are you doing okay? And at oh, the time they you know sent them, I didn't know what all was going on because you keep me in the dark unless you absolutely have to reveal otherwise. <laughs> Uh, and so you, you had told me, Hey, I just, I, I got some other things going on or, Hey, I just can't record today. And that happens. I mean, you know, we all, we each have things that come up. So I didn't assume right. any physical malady initially. Of course you did tell me back a week or so ago what was going on, but so right. I, I did respond and I just want these people to know, yeah, we're, I, I would say, yeah, everything's okay. We just had some things come up. So just know if you were the one to whom I sent that email, I wasn't intentionally lying or obfuscating the truth. I was just sharing what I knew at the time. Okay. So you weren't intentionally lying. Do you ever unintentionally lie? I, I, I guess I probably share false information <laughs> without knowing it. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't. Anyway, I, that, I don't know how in the world I heard it, but I, I think I was lifting some heavy boxes back in August. Uh, and uh, I worked with a chiropractor for about five weeks, and it just persistently became worse and worse. And they they, they found uh, uh, an anomaly they had to address. And, and anyway, there's no problem whatsoever. We're back to normal. And Good. I have missed being able to be with you and being able Me to too. study the book of Hebrews together. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful we're back together. And, and I thank everyone that has reached out saying, are you all okay? Mm -hmm. That indicates that we have so many that are uh, enjoying studying God's word together. And that's what this is all about, really. Yeah, so right. let's remind ourselves this season, we are looking at descriptors of Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Actually, this is the second of two seasons that we're, we're doing that. And we find ourselves today in Hebrews chapter 10. And the descriptor of Jesus that we're looking at today from Hebrews 10, verse 1 through about verse 10 or so, uh, is the incarnate Emmanuel. Now, I want you to pause for a moment. <clears throat> Robert, I want you to help me with those two words, incarnate, Emmanuel. First of all, help me with the word incarnate. That's not a word I use every every week of the year. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. does that mean? Well, it just means that Jesus came in the flesh. It, it's uh, uh, it, he he was manifested here in the physical realm. He he became human. That's that's kind of the summary of what that word represents. Okay, Jesus became flesh. So I'm, yes. my mind always goes, I'm sure like yours, to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Then verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Mm -hmm. Of course, Romans chapter 1, verse 3, He was... Um, uh, proven to be the son of God, uh, uh, being the son of our seed of David, according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. Then you have, was it first Peter, first Timothy chapter three, about verse 15, he was manifested 
in the flesh. Peter tells us he bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross. So there are so many references through the New Testament that actually tell us that Jesus became a human being. He became flesh. And of course, if we'll remember from season past, when we were in Hebrews chapter 2, the entirety of Hebrews chapter 2 deals with the humanity of Jesus, in addition to chapter 1, dealing with the deity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So today we're thinking about the incarnate, the having become flesh, Emmanuel. Help me with that word, Emmanuel. So uh, Emmanuel would be a, a proper noun, right? And we're getting this from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Right. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. And then I love this because now we figure out what that means, which means right. God with us. So, Don't you love the way the Holy Spirit at times uses a word and then he says, um, let me tell you what that means. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> I, do too. I just truly enjoy it whenever we come to verses like that. So Emmanuel means God with us. When we're talking about the incarnate Emmanuel, we're talking about Jesus as the one who became flesh and in the process became one who was God living with or among man. Mm -hmm. God with man. <clears throat> now, symbolically speaking, the whole book of Hebrews teaches that very thing when you consider Jesus as our high priest, mm -hmm. our mediator. He is still incarnate, the one who became flesh, and he is still the one who is God on our side, God with us. Mm -hmm. So incarnate Emmanuel, Jesus as the one who became flesh and was God among man, Jesus who is the one who was in, raised and is in his resurrected body and is still with man, on man's, the Christian's side, God with us. So as we said often, he's at God's side, but he's on our side, God with us, the incarnate Jesus, Emmanuel. Now, Hebrews chapter 10 is all about that. And not just the fact that Jesus became flesh, but what that actually means for us. Mm -hmm. I would like to read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 through 7. And then I want to throw it in your direction and let you kind of flesh this out for us, this idea of Jesus becoming flesh and what all was involved in that. And then... Uh, I'll try to close things out toward the end of our episode by looking at some of the blessings that can be ours because Jesus actually became flesh. Oh, wow. So here's Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, now that phraseology right there is an implicit reference to his becoming flesh. But it says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So Jesus actually cites a passage of Scripture, Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. And in doing so, he references the fact, I have been given a body by God, so that I could sacrifice that body to bring God and man together. What a blessing. Now, I want you to take that, Robert, and flesh that out some more, and teach me and all of us that are listening, um, what all was involved in this idea of God giving Jesus a body, Jesus becoming flesh in our behalf? Mm. This is a, a really neat text. And as you said, it's continuing a theme 
that we've already seen throughout the book of Hebrews. I mean, even even back in chapter 2, after establishing the superiority of Jesus over angels, he says he does not give aid to angels in Hebrews 2, 14, 15, and 16, but it says he had to be made like his brothers, and it talks about him sharing in flesh and blood. Yeah. So this certainly isn't the first time that we've seen the concept of Jesus being the incarnate Emmanuel in the book of Hebrews, but there's a special focus here as we come to chapter 10, and as we've seen, it has to do with the sacrifices, the offerings, the necessity of a physical body that's a part of that, and what the implications are as a result of this body that has been offered and what that means for you and for me. And so that makes right. Hebrews 10, 5 and following really, really special. Jesus did come, and that was a point that was really important back in the first century times. That There were in probably early forms, and I don't know if the writer of Hebrews is addressing this specifically, uh, maybe not, but there, there were some uh, people in the first century cultures who wanted to challenge whether the Messiah could come in a bodily form. I think John deals with that a lot in 1 John, and of course by the time you get to the second century, those thoughts have sort of materialized into a full-blown false movement called right. Gnosticism, and uh, it, it had various offshoots and things like that. So anyway, all that to say, stressing that Jesus came in the flesh was extremely important. And then by application, what, what that means, you know, why he had to come in the flesh. Not only that he did, but why he did makes for very fruitful study. And that's mm -hmm. what we see as we came here. So he came, and he came for a reason. As we come to Hebrews 10, I, I kind of look at this in three sections. Um, we see the attitude of Jesus' earthly ministry. And then we see the actions of his earthly ministry. All right, so how he thought when he came. And what he did when he came. And then Great. in the third place, we see the accomplishments. In other words, what did he do? What, what, why did he do what he did? For what purpose or to what end? Yeah. And I think we see that borne out for us, particularly if we extend our reading down maybe through verse 10 or so. So looking at the text once again, look at the attitude of his coming. Notice verse 5, when Christ came into the world. So the writer of Hebrews believes that this Christ, the incarnate Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, Christ, came into the world. And uh, look down at verse 7. Behold, I have come. So here's this Emmanuel, God with us, uh, really being uh, emphasized. He said, and as you noted, uh, the writer of Hebrews, and really the Holy Spirit, uh, cites Psalm 40, but puts these words into the mouth of Jesus. And so it's as though Jesus is saying these words. Maybe it would be good, if we're going to dig into this text a little bit, to look at Psalm 40 for just a moment. And okay. if I pull up this tab, and I don't have Psalm 40 all magically ready, so here it comes. Uh, the the ancient superscription that precedes verse 1, you know, this <clears throat> these parts... Uh, are added in. They're not inspired, but they are extremely old. So this is ancient Jewish tradition with regard to the human penman of this inspired psalm. And this one says that this is a psalm of David. When we put these words into the, the mouth or through the pen of David, that makes this kind of interesting, and it may help us interpret sort of the sense of this psalm. Here's this king of Israel, this chosen king, chosen by God himself, uh, commissioned by the prophet Samuel, of course, guided by God the Father, to be this leader of the Old Testament children of Israel, of the Israelite nation, the second king of Israel during the great united kingdom uh, before so many of the downfalls that plague Old Testament Israel. So here's this king, and uh, some have noted that this psalm, the words of a king, could be divided into two main sections. You sort of have this sense of verses 1 through 11, 
uh, giving an individual thanksgiving psalm in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who doesn't turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. And then verse 6 begins the quotation that the writer of Hebrews gives us in Hebrews 10. In sacrifice and offering you've not delighted, but you have given to me, interesting variant here from our quotation in Hebrews, an open ear. Hebrews 10 says, a body you have prepared for me. More on that in a minute. Burnt offering and sin offering you've not required, he continued. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, your laws within my heart. I've told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. I've not restrained my lips. I've not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I've spoken of your faithfulness and salvation. I haven't concealed your steadfast love, and faithfulness will uh, preserve me. So um, I look at some of this, and I, I see this song of thanksgiving from the inspired, yes, heart of a king. In fact, a great king, <laughs> the one who's uh, about whom we have this wonderful prophecy back in 2 Samuel 7 that one would come and reign on the throne of David forever and ever, and that finds fulfillment in Jesus. In verse 12 of Psalm 40, if we just sort of close this loop down through the end of the psalm, verse 17, there's sort of another section, and it is notably um, one of lament. Evils have encompassed me beyond number. Iniquities have overtaken me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, and so on. I know that this isn't within the purview of this episode, and so we'll just summarize this enough to say that here's this king, all right, and and yes, with words of thanksgiving on his lips, but also with some pains of difficulties that he's feeling. He summarizes the thoughts of his heart and even of his reign by saying, my purpose is to delight in you, to obey you. Now think about where David sits and think about his predecessor on the throne, King Saul. And Saul was told by the prophet Samuel, to obey is better than to sacrifice, Mm -hmm. to hearken or listen than the fat of rams. And now, according to ancient Jewish tradition, we have this next king, in fact, wasn't it right after that moment in 1 Samuel, what is it, 15, when Samuel has to tell Saul, you've mm-hmm. disobeyed. Oh, sure, you, you've kept back some of the finer things uh, from the spoils of war, even though God told you not to take any of it and to utterly destroy it all. But you've kept it back, and, and you did your own will, but you did it in the name of God because you said, well, look, I'm, I'm going to take this, and, and we're going to use this uh, in, in sacrifice to God. And uh, Saul was supposed to wait on Samuel to come down and offer that sacrifice, but Saul sort of felt like time was getting short, and Samuel wasn't there yet, and so Saul just took it upon himself, and that's why Samuel comes in and rebukes him to obey. Yes, you, you've done something that on the outside seems good, but you didn't obey the Lord, and obedience is more important than just going through these religious-type rituals. And so in Psalm 46 and 7, here's this King David, who is king now, even though Saul's reign really, I guess, should have continued. I guess it could have continued on. But David is now on the throne. And David is saying, God, I recognize this fact. You wish for me to do your will. I have come. And then he says in verse 7, in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. And scholars believe that perhaps this has reference to uh, going back to the law for kings back in Deuteronomy and how kings were supposed to, when they began their uh, reign over Israel, they were supposed to write their own copy of the law of Moses. And uh, all of that was written. 
interestingly <laughs> enough, in a time long before the Israelites came to Samuel and said, we want a king like the nations around us. But Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, had given these commands for those who would serve as kings over Israel. And so here's David, and we believe he he must have done that. He must have made that copy of the law, and he's saying, oh, I delight in your will. Your law is in my heart. Here's the sentiment of this king of the Old Testament in Psalm 40, and he says, my attitude in my reign as king over your people is to obey you. Plug that thought into the context of Hebrews 10. Here's the writer, and he's saying Christ came into the world. He's God with us. Now, how is this one who in all points was equal to God the Father, how is he going to conduct himself when he comes into this realm, which, as we've already noted from Hebrews chapter 1, he created he's the agent of creation and he steps himself into this realm and uh how's he going to interact with with uh not only human beings and setting an example for them but even relating to the other members of the godhead who are not manifest in human form as he is and to encapsulate the heart of jesus as he's on earth to really push his attitude the Hebrews writer, the Holy Spirit through the writer of Hebrews, inserts the words that we've just considered from the 40th Psalm. All right, David was this king. He's got this authority. But here's his attitude. Here's Jesus. He's the Christ, the Messiah. He was the Word in his pre-incarnate state. And now he comes, and when he came into the world, he says, it's not just about external religious piety. It's about a heart of obedience that would motivate those activities. I have come to do your will, O God, Hebrews 10, verse 7. And then the writer elaborates on all of that to make some applications. Can I make just a a comment about the 40th Psalm, and then I'll take a breath because I'm sure there's things that need to be said got some applications as well, but if we go back to the 40th Psalm, you'll, you may notice that there is a slight difference between the quotation that is given in the Hebrews account, Hebrews 10 verse 5, and what we read in Psalm, verse, Psalm chapter 40 verses 6 and 7. We may cause us to wonder. In fact, it's a pretty significant variant. Hebrews 10, sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Psalm 40 verse 6, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given to me an open ear. And the the ESV has a footnote that the Hebrew actually says something like, ears you have dug for me. (laughs) (laughs) That don't make much sense, does it? Well, it's certainly painting a word picture that is somewhat interesting, right? Uh, (laughs) This... The change from, an uh, and by the way, an open ear is sort of giving us the sense of this digging ears. You know, the idea of the the Hebrew there is, uh, my ears are open unto you. you you've, you've dug that passageway to get into my heart. And of you course, he says my there, ears so you I can cleaned hear. it out. Oh, there you go. <laughs> wow. That's well, one way okay. to think about it. Okay. <laughs> He says in verse 8 of Psalm 40, your law is within my heart. Yeah. The interesting thing, though, and really the issue is, why in Hebrews 10 would it be changed to a body you have prepared for me? He doesn't say anything about digging out my ears. He says something about a body that's been prepared. And the interesting thing is the Hebrew, uh, the quotation out of Hebrews 10 is actually taken from the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX, Uh, Mm -hmm. standing for the 70, which refers to the 70 individuals who were involved in producing this Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. That's what the Septuagint was and is. And scholars have gone back and they see that in the Septuagint, this variant is actually made. And the reason why it's believed is because this really gives the sense, according to what I've read, of really what 
the, uh, the Hebrew was driving at here in Psalm 40. It certainly uh, applies when it references Jesus himself. Did Jesus have an open ear to God's law? Well, of course he did. <laughs> but what Jesus does is he's willing to enact his entire body quite literally, giving himself fully over to the will of God in order to obey the will of God. And so it's believed that the reason why the Septuagint translators changed it over from ear to body is to give the sense of what that original Hebrew would have meant. Um, and of isn't course, it interesting yeah. that Jesus quoted from the Septuagint That's right. rather than from the actual Hebrew? Yeah. He would have been able to do both. But right. it, that's intriguing to me. Yeah. Very much so. And perhaps even lend some credence to the thought behind right that translation difference, uh, that this really was the sense of what was getting at back there in yes. Psalm 40. Yes. Uh, but, and it certainly applies then in the context here of Hebrews 10, Christ came and he was given a physical body and he came. And here's the point of this long explanation with this attitude of obedience. I have come verse nine to do your will. Uh, it's not merely about the externals. It's the externals motivated by this internal uh, mm -hmm. attitude of obedience. And so it was a commitment to the will of God. And if I just step back a minute, I'll make this application point that I've got and then take a breath. I'm sure you have some insights. But when I think about this and I think about Jesus' example of a commitment to God's will, he came and he said, not my will, but thine be done, right. uh, especially in the garden scene in Matthew 26, although that wasn't the only time that he made a statement like that during his ministry. And here the writer of Hebrews says his whole earthly ministry was characterized by that, that thought, that mindset of obedience. And I just want to ask myself, am I committed to the will of the Lord mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. And as we're going to see, Jesus was obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. And so maybe I step back and I ask myself, does my commitment have limits? Jesus did the will of God, even when it cost him everything in terms of his physical life. But we could argue Jesus's sacrifices began even before the cross, when he gave up Philippians two, five through eight, mm -hmm. equality with God to be made like a slave and so I need to ask myself, in light of, inspired by the commitment that Jesus had and the fact is we're going to see that he did that for me, am I, do I have any, is there anything in my life that's holding me back from having that level of commitment to God, my Father, but also to Jesus, my Savior? That's the attitude so of hearing, his earthly ministry. What I'm hearing you say, we go back to Psalm 40, written, as the superscription suggests, by David. Mm -hmm. And David says, in essence, God, you put me in this world for this purpose, to delightfully obey yeah. your will. I am here, <clears throat> excuse me, I am here so that with the delight of my heart, I can do what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is the one in Hebrews 10 that cites this passage from David as if to say himself, Father, I am in this world for one purpose, to mm. with delight do what you want me to do. And in application, as you just made, that's actually the way you and I should see ourselves and to see ourselves within the framework of obeying God's word. I'm reminded, uh, Robert, of 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not irksome, or his commandments <laughs> are not grievous. Yeah. In other words, uh, I love God, and I am going to do what God wants me to do because of my love, and I delight in that. I don't find that to be a problem. That was the heart of David. 
That was the heart of Jesus and an application of use has said so beautifully, that should be the heart of us today. So here's Jesus, the incarnate Emmanuel, and we have reference to the attitude of his earthly ministry, an attitude of, I find great delight in doing what you, God, my Father, wants me to do. Mm -hmm. Now, you you said, here's a second point, the actions of Jesus' earthly ministry as the incarnate Emmanuel. Help me with that. What actions are you talking about? So Jesus has this attitude, I want to do your will. Well, what was that will in which he would Uh delight? We come down to Hebrews 10 and we examine again these uh, some of these thoughts here in verses 5 and 7 and 9. Uh, it's not merely the sacrifices and offerings in which God delights. It is the listening ear and, by application, a willingness even to give of myself in order to do this. With that attitude of delighting in those things, we find out in verse 9 Uh, that Jesus did come to obey that will. And in verse 10, by that will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So here comes Jesus, and he took on human flesh, and he did that for us. He did that in order to make this sacrifice. Now, as we just mentioned, and boy, you can dig into a passage like Philippians 2, and I know we've referenced Mm. it a lot on this uh, podcast over the years. I come to Philippians 2, though, just to remind us. uh, uh, Paul says, I want you to have this mind among yourselves. So remember, he's only referencing this as an illustration to call us toward a degree of sacrifice. There's an application Mm -hmm. already building here. Jesus, Philippians 2, verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, Paul is stating that in the negative. So look at the positive of what he's saying. He was willing to let something go. You know, if you're grasping something, boy, that that hand is clenched uh, almost like a fist. I'm, I'm not willing to let go, but to let it go. Well, that's what Jesus was willing to do. And when he did that, verse 7, he emptied himself. He emptied himself and became in the likeness of men. And what does that look like? Well, verse 7 in the middle tells me he took the form of a servant. By the way, sidebar, uh, what have I been created to do? I'm Hmm. created to serve, to serve God and to take delight in his will, realizing, as you just quoted from 1 John 5, that his commandments are not burdensome to me. They're really for my good. Well, Jesus came not only to imitate that, he very or, or to uh, exemplify that. In so doing, he very much lived it. And being found in human form, Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Now, we could the verse could stop there, and that would be breathtaking. I mean, to, to think about what Jesus did, he, he existed in the form of God, but he willingly let that go to empty himself and to come in the form of a servant. But Paul, and I think, I think the language here is supposed to sort of push this, to drive it forward. He became obedient. He became obedient to the point of death. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Uh, a terrible way to die, a humiliating way to die. And Jesus was willing to do all of that for us. The actions of his ministry, okay, his attitude is obedience. The actions, if we were to summarize it in a word, I think it's an offering. He came to offer himself realizing that the sacrifice of that offering began the moment he left heaven and came to earth. And and, and every part of his incarnation seems backwards from the way we would have done it if we had written the story. You know, why didn't he burst on the scene as a valiant warrior, uh, maybe much like the Jews expected him to, 
putting the religious leaders right in their place, you know, who were oppressing all the people beneath them. Why didn't he come and set up his earthly kingdom the way that the apostles thought that he would? Uh, you know, wh- wh- why didn't he do some of these? Well, he was humble in every part. He came and he came, well, the way every human begins, at least in their physical life on earth. And uh, his incarnation began as a as a baby. And not a rich one at that, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and then you just, you keep working your, his, through his ministry up from there as we did, as we worked through the, the gospel of Mark in our very first couple of seasons and man, what a, a wonderful person, what a wonderful life he lived, but there was sacrifice in every bit of that. Um, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He who was rich. Yet, for our sakes, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. The actions of his earthly ministry, that which he delighted to do because it was the will of the Father, is summarized, I think, in the writer of Hebrews is telling us this, in his offering. There at verse 10, once again, by that will, the will of God, the will that has been emphasized, he delights to do. Your will I've come to do, O oh God. I, I want to do that in which you take pleasure, that which you desire. I've come to do your will. And that involved the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Now, he came and did that because that's what the Father required. And the Father required it because that was what was necessary in order to bring humanity out of the sin in which we had gotten ourselves and to reconcile us back to God, to, for us to be liberated from, redeemed uh, out of our past sins and forgiven of all of that. Jesus prayed the night before the cross, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We know the answer to that prayer based on the events that transpired subsequent to the prayer being prayed. It, there wasn't any other way. This is what had to happen. And Jesus is pictured in Hebrews 10 as the offering for our sins, a sacrifice for us. And not only that, he delighted to do <clears throat> that. <clears throat> that was the attitude that motivated the actions because... Put in his very mouth are the words of Psalm 40. You don't delight merely in begrudging offerings. It's not just about the external. There was this heart that motivated such a wonderful sacrifice. May I ask you, dear listener or viewer, even as I've asked myself and studying this wonderful chapter, am I willing, are you, to sacrifice for him? We studied what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus recently in our seasons, and we noted that Jesus requires some sacrifice of us if we'll follow him. Jesus sacrificed all. Am I willing to give my all in service to him? That's the action. So his his attitude as the incarnate Emmanuel was God put me in this world to delightfully do what he wants done. Mm. And with that attitude, the action of his earthly ministry was to literally allow himself to be sacrificed, to give up his life in the body, Mm. to sacrifice his life through death via the cross. So he made that sacrifice in our behalf. What about the accomplishments? What's (laughs) what flows into our lives Mm -hmm. prospectively or into the lives of anybody prospectively because of this attitude of Jesus and these actions of Jesus? What are the accomplishments of his earthly ministry? Well, let's look and I'll, I'll introduce this and then I'd, I'm going to throw it to you so you can flesh it out for us in a better way. But when I come to Hebrews chapter 10, I see that there are several things that are driving this. Uh, I'll just point out a couple, and you may have some more you want to point out. But 
In verse 9, it says, he added, Behold, I've come to do your will. And then it says, he does away with the first in order to establish the second. Mm-hmm. As I'm looking first back, at, what? <laughs> well, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm looking back at this and I'm thinking, okay, offerings, burn offerings, sin offerings, verse 8, mm-hmm. which are offered according to the law. And he does away with translating a term that's an interesting word choice, abolished. He abolished the first law in order to establish the second law. And we've already seen some some hints at this throughout. Of course, the writer of Hebrews is really going to bear this out more uh, as we as we continue. All right, more on that in a minute. Let me point out the second one and then uh, throw it your way. Okay. By that will, that will, the will of God, Mm-hmm. That will, a will that involved an offering for sin, that will, a will that involved abolishing the first law in order to establish the second, by that will, we, now the we, this is the first time really we have been referenced up to this point in Hebrews chapter 10. So I have to go all the way back to Hebrews nine twenty eight. Christ came, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. He's referring to us, Christians. And he'll appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. All right, we're talking about us Christians. And I come down here to verse 10. By that will, we, Christians, have been sanctified. There's a neat word. Through through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So this offering has pointed to, it made possible, it accomplishes several things. We see from Hebrews chapter 10, we have this new will, this new law, this new covenant. We could even say a new testament (laughs) that is enacted as a result of Jesus coming to do the will of God the Father. And we have an open door to sanctification, sanctified, Hebrews 10, verse 10. All right, so if I'm just summarizing, and then we'll let you dig into these. All right, if his attitude is obedience and his actions he offers, he, he's an offering, then the accomplishments, well, I see overcoming. Overcoming. Throughout Hebrews, Jesus' way is better. Jesus is better. And if Jesus is better and his way is better, we've already established in context that his priesthood as high priest is better. And we're going to see a little more of that as we go on in Hebrews 10. But he's already sort of introduced that thought back in Hebrews 7, 8, 9. And so there's this better. And there were limitations to the old covenant and the old law. And so Jesus comes, and in abolishing the first He establishes the second, and he overcomes the limitations that were in place with the first. That's good news. Mm -hmm. I like that. More on that in a bit, especially as the rest of the chapter proceeds. And then he sanctified. We're going to talk about this made holy, this process of making us holy. Well, under the old law, there was a remembrance for sins every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Jesus has made it possible for me to be cleansed and made holy, overcoming not just the limitations of the old law, but really, and this speaks more to the point, overcoming the effects of sin on my soul. And so as I look at the accomplishments of Jesus' ministry per this text, I see these two things, and they point me to that conclusion of overcoming. What a wonderful passage, and what a great (laughs) breakdown of the passage. In my mind, I'm following you, and so I'm I'm going to write on the canvas of my mind what I heard. (laughs) First of all, I heard the word attitude, Mm. of course, talking about the attitude of Jesus. Jesus. And from the word attitude, I draw an arrow across the page horizontally, and I write the word obedience. Under the word attitude, I write a second word, and that's the word uh, da, 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 actions. Actions, yeah. And then I draw a line, an arrow from the word actions horizontally over, and I write the word uh, offering. 
offering himself at the cross. And then under the word um, actions, I write the word accomplishment, and I draw a line and arrow horizontally from accomplishments, uh, and then I write the word overcoming, overcoming uh, the limitations of the old covenant, actually even allowing us to overcome our past, right. all because yes. of that offering due to his obedience. What a great breakdown of Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 10, Robert. Thank you. Yes. Uh, if I could kind of um, dovetail onto your accomplishments observation, I'd like to look at chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, and I see a stark contrast being made between what the Old Testament or Old Covenant could not do, provide, mm. and what the New Testament, new arrangement made possible for through Jesus can make possible for us. And so the accomplishment concept. Let's begin uh, looking at chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And there are three things that we read in Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4, three things the old arrangement, the old covenant could not do for mankind. Let's read. Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come. Pause. Good things to come. That takes my mind back to chapter 9, verse 11. If you could throw that up on the screen for us. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. I don't know that I've ever noticed until preparing for this podcast, mm. the the have come, the past tense in Hebrews 9 verse 11. Hebrews 9 verse 11 says, okay, all the good things that were going to come that were being predicted in the old arrangement, they have now come. And they've come because Jesus has come and because of what Jesus did when he came. What a beautiful thought. So now back to Hebrews 10, verse 1. I just had to kind of throw that in. For That's since great. the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the form of these realities, it can never... Now, it's going to talk about, as you observed, the inadequacies of the old arrangement. It can never, by the same sacrifices, the Old Testament sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So the old arrangement, with the old arrangement, there was no perfection. You could not be spiritually complete and what God wanted you to be with the old arrangement. It could not make that happen. It was inadequate. Verse 2, otherwise would they, these Old Testament sacrifices, not have ceased to be offered since the worshiper Worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. By the way, not having a consciousness of sins is the Bible's definition of forgiveness. When God forgives you, He doesn't think about your past anymore. When you're forgiven, you don't have to think about your past anymore either. No more consciousness of sins. But now here's a thought. In this contextual flow... We're talking about what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do, and they could not make you perfect, spiritually complete. Still further, no perfection. The Old Testament sacrifices could not grant you purification. They could not give you no more consciousness of sin because they had to be offered year after year after year. So there was no perfection and there was no lasting purification from the old covenant and its sacrifices. But then verse 3, in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats. That would be a reference to those sacrifices made on the Day of Atonement, 
back in chapter 9, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Impossible for the blood of, bu blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Taking away sins takes me back in thought, if I read backwards to chapter 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, or some translations say no remission. So there's no perfection from Old Testament law. There's no purification from Old Testament law. There's no remission of sins from Old Testament law and all of those Old Testament sacrifices. That's what the old arrangement and the sacrifices of bulls and goats could not do. Now, pause for a moment, because as I keep reading, I come to verses 5 through 8, Actually, we come down all the way through verse 10 and following, and I'm reading about another sacrifice. And that gets back to Jesus having a body prepared for him, his coming in the flesh. And we get back to his being in the flesh and that attitude of obedience, his being in the flesh and those actions of offering himself as a sacrifice. So, the old law could not grant, it could not give you purification, uh, perfection, purification, or remission of sins. Jesus, as a result, came in the flesh and offered his body as a sacrifice. Now watch what happens as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus to dovetail on your accomplishments of his earthly ministry. I come down to verse 14. By a single offering, that's the actions of his earthly ministry, his offerings, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. With the sacrifice of Jesus, I can be perfect. I can be spiritually complete. By the sacrifice of Jesus, I can be what God wants me to be. What the Old Testament and its sacrifices could not make possible, the body of Jesus and his sacrifice does make possible. I can be what God wants me to be today, not because of my spiritual prowess or my continued sacrifices. I can be what God wants me to be, spiritually perfect, because Jesus sacrificed himself. And that's why wow. I love him so much. Hey, here's something else. I keep reading, and it says, by a single offering, verse 14, he has perfected for all time those who are being, that special word you said, sanctified. Now, the word sanctified is hagiadzo, and the cognate noun of hagiadzo would be hagios, and guess what the word hagios means, holy or holy. Pure, And so when I read about being sanctified, I read about being made pure. Look at this. The old law with its sacrifices could not make one perfect, spiritually complete. It could not grant one spiritual purification. But Jesus, with his sacrifice, can make me spiritually complete, and it can make me pure from my past. What a thought. And then we read these beautiful words in verses 15 through 17. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. And he references the new covenant, the new arrangement in contrast to the old. I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I'll put my laws on their hearts, write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's forgiveness or remission. Watch what has happened in Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 18. The old law with its sacrifices could not make one spiritual.
spiritually perfect, complete. The old law with its sacrifices could not grant one purification from his or her past. The old law with its sacrifices could not grant the remission forgiveness of sins. But here comes Jesus who said, you've made a body for me and I will delight in obeying you and sacrifice that body in keeping with your will. And because of Jesus sacrificing his body, the new law arrangement has been made possible. So now we have a new law with the sacrifice of Jesus, and that new law with the sacrifice of Jesus makes it possible for you and me to be spiritually perfect. It makes it possible for you and me to be spiritually perfect. Pure. It makes it possible for you and me to be forgiven, to know the remission of sins. The old would not grant perfection, purification, or remission. But here comes Jesus with his body. He makes the sacrifice of his body, the cross. And because of that, with Jesus and the new law, there is perfection, there is purification, and there is remission. In point of fact, Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 18 says, the new law can do what the old law wasn't even designed to do, what it couldn't do. And it's possible for the new law to do that because because one man, because one man was willing to come and be a man, live as a man, and sacrifice himself as a man for me. And that man we know to be Jesus, the incarnate Emmanuel. And that's why, Robert, we should love him more and more every day. Look what we have and who we can be yeah. because of who he was willing to become and what he was willing to do. Without Jesus, we're still stuck. Not being able to be what God wants, not being pure, just defiled with our past, not ever being forgiven and having no place in the heart of God. But with Jesus, all of that is different. Mm. What a wonderful blessing we have in Jesus and why we say every day is a great day with Jesus. Yeah, that's Wrap right. it up for us. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking, and, and of course, we're not getting into it now, but if you, you take all of that and read the back half of Hebrews 10, in light of this reality that he's just described in the first half of Hebrews 10. And you see, we have exhortations. We're going to stir each other up. You know, we're, we're going to try and motivate each other to keep going by reminding each other of these beautiful truths. And I'm leaving today's episode <laughs> with that very spirit. It's really great. Well, I'm ready for the next episode in the latter, that latter half of chapter 10. Yeah. And boy, we, we're going to be built up from that given yes. section of the chapter. <laughs> That's true. And we see how blessed we are in the first half. And now we're going to see how built up we can be and how built up we should make one another because mm -hmm. in the second half, because of the first half of the chapter, it's just, yeah. I, I can't, I, I keep saying, man, this is one of the greatest chapters of the Bible <laughs> every time we come to a chapter in Hebrews, but don't you feel that way regardless of what book you're in? Well, and it, yes. And, and so much of that is because of the common thread and all of that, which is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is what infuses the greatness so much. So, yeah. Yes, amen. Hey, we want to appreciate you, uh, express our appreciation to you for watching or listening to this edition. We uh, recently got some feedback that there was a mom and two kiddos who were <laughs> studiously watching uh, today with Jesus and said that at least one of the kiddos sat and listened the whole hour. But the picture revealed the other, the other kiddo... <laughs> Well, as you said before we recorded, they must have been listening when I was talking. Cause <laughs> the other one was asleep. <laughs> the other one was asleep. <laughs> that was great. I loved it. 
And I, I, I commented to Robert. I said, I, I, "I've been there before. Half the audience goes <laughs> asleep." That's right. But hey, you know, listen. Oh, I, I know that precious kiddo is a blessing, but it was probably helpful to mom that uh, kiddo was asleep so she could listen to today with Jesus. So. <laughs> and don't you don't you appreciate that mama wanting to yes. deepen her love for Jesus by yes. a study of Scripture through this and perhaps other podcasts? Too. That's right. And then her post yeah. encouraged us uh, and. and and we're so grateful uh, to Amen. have that feedback. We love to hear from you. Uh, you can uh, reach out to us at any moment. Go to thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ. That stands for Today with Jesus. You'll find episode archives, subscription links, and the contact form whereby you can get in touch with us. We do release uh, new episodes on Tuesdays from our podcast partners on YouTube and our website, thelightnetwork.tv. And we're always grateful to get to spend time with you. I'm glad we're back in the recording chairs again. Amen. Me too. <laughs> Hope you all live today and every day with Jesus in your heart and in your ways. We'll see you next time. God bless everybody. Bye.